Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be closing up the event today uh, with my project, the Virtual Natural History Museum, or VNHM. So, but first, a little bit about me. I wouldn't identify myself as a paleontologist. Despite being a paleontologist, I'm actually a computer nerd. And uh, I will sacrifice any time to play computer games, whether or not I've got a deadline or not, gaming comes first. If the clan has a game on Battlefield, you know, I'm there rather than reading new papers. But I also do a lot of uh, outreach stuff, so uh, with Paleocast, the podcast. And again, computer gaming comes into that. So I can do things like uh, playthroughs of computer games and like do those from a paleontological perspective if you're playing uh, something like Saurian or Chorok or something. And then I've used like, computer gaming technology to be able to live stream conferences and stuff. So there's, there's a huge interaction with me between paleontology and gaming. But when I'm not doing that, I'm actually a part-time PhD student looking at arthropods and the chelicerates, so spiders, scorpions, and sea scorpions especially. And then uh, for work, I work as an outreach officer uh, at the Cabot Institute, which is the university's uh, place for uh, changing environments and energy and food supply and do a lot of outreach stuff with that. And then I've also got a background in the oil industry, so it's quite a disparate group of things that I do. But anyway, uh, psychoms is what we're talking about today. And when you're an academic, it sometimes feels that your street uh, feels that you're like streets apart from your audience, and that is what is represented here by this metaphor or analogy. Uh, we have a scientist with his lovely science at the top, separated by a road from his audience at the bottom. Uh, other uh, genders and ethnicities are available, but these were just the characters I have. So you want to you engage, but there's a lot of distractions in the way. And I don't know if any of you have played Frogger before, but we have to get a little guy. There we go. And a winner is in DG. So we're thinking about avoiding all of these distractions. But in Frogger, there's also another section to the game, which is where you've got to cross a river. And instead of avoiding these things, these are logs in Frogger, you actually use them to get across. And I've not actually calibrated this, so I don't think it's actually possible to do, but we'll try. <laughs> yeah, we, I made it, I made it. <laughs> and so I like to think that this is the better uh, metaphor. Be the logs. Use these distractions to your advantage. The question shouldn't be, uh, like, I'm a scientist, I've got this science, now how can I get my audience to engage with it? Instead, it should be, I'm a scientist, I have this science, now what is my target audience engaging with, and then how can I make this about my science? So a good example of this is uh, the computer game Saurian. It's just been funded on uh, Kickstarter, and what it is is a computer game where you play as a dinosaur in the Lake Cretaceous Hell Creek formation. And these guys have used computer gaming uh, kind of like paleo art in the same way. They've um, looked at all the biomechanics, they've got in touch with the experts and really went to town on making this more of a simulation than um, anything else. Uh, and whilst it is no, by no means perfect, it, it gets towards where we want to be. And so, yeah, I think this is a pretty good example of like using uh, a medium which uh, the audience is really engaged with to deliver science. And this is shown uh, from the crowdfunding campaign. So they needed $55,000 and they got almost five times that amount. From 6,570 backers, they said that they liked this idea so much that they gave $33.59 on average each. And then even one guy donated uh, 1,355. He liked that idea so much that he was willing to give that much money. And it just goes to show is if you get the, the thing that the audience are engaging with, then you can make it about your science and people are going to engage with it. But that's all well and good for um, the more casual market. But how can we get these principles of engaging the audience with what they want to be engaged with into a more formal setting. How can we get it into schools like Ernst and Grammar School here and into the minds of uh, handsome young children like this guy here? 
Um, well, the, the thing that we would have to do is really get in touch with teachers. It's no good as an outsider saying, hey, teachers, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they know best what's going on in their classrooms. They know their kids, they know the, um, the curriculum and where it falls short. They know the uh, outreach um, opportunities. And this is something that the Earth Science Teachers Association have actually already done for paleontology. And back in 2012, they wrote an open letter to the Paleontological Association. They asked all their members, like, what, what's going on in your classrooms and how can we make this better? And so they, they wrote this letter in which they said that paleontology can be this massive factor in getting kids to follow earth sciences. But often uh, teachers are restricted by what they can deliver in the classrooms. They, they would love to have fossils, they'd love to have replicas and models and 3D printed stuff. But they just can't do it. They don't have the money, they don't have the support. Uh, sometimes, if you're in an inner city location, you can get in touch with the museums or the universities in their area. But if we're looking at schools like in the Outer Hebrides, for example, uh, they're not going to be able to get that kind of support. And so, yeah, it can be difficult. And they went through the whole curriculum and they outlined all the places for all the different curricula. There's two in the UK. And they went through point by point and highlighted everywhere that they needed extra resources. And the things, the two points that really came out from this was that they need a source of copyright free images that they can draw upon. And then also uh, some interactive uh, web based resources and games and stuff. So highlighted those two points. Firstly, as a paleontologist, and many of the paleontologists here would know that. Finding a picture of a fossil can be easy if you know where it is, if you know where it's kept, what it's called, uh, you can just go on the websites of museums and have a look at their digitized collections and just go and find it. I know, for example, Drepanopterus abonensis, I can find it on the GB3D website. Um, but for a teacher, if they're going on, and in this case, trying to find brachiopods, uh, they type it in and you've got 1,607 results, over 161 pages of brachiopods to sort through until you find the one that's appropriate for your lesson. And these things are absolutely brilliant. This, this first one has high resolution photos you can zoom in and out of. It's got stereoscopic pictures you can put 3D glasses on and see in 3D. It's got rotatable models that you can download and print off. But to actually sit down and go through 161 pages of these until you find the right one for your lessons, it's just not uh, feasible, it's not workable. And likewise, the kids can't go on this website and be engaged and want to say like, hey, we've done the first six pages, let's go on and do the 150 whatever maths more. Uh, and, but to be fair, these websites weren't intended uh, for this purpose. They weren't intended to be an outreach um, thing, so can't really hold that against them. But that, this is where my project, the Virtual Natural History Museum, comes in, because it's intended to use the existing multimedia that's housed on all of these websites and across the internet and give it an engaging uh, user interface and something that can be used in education as well. Uh, I'm just going to do the credits now. Uh, it's all thanks to the Paleontological Association and the grant that they gave us and the flexibility that uh, they gave us with that. Uh, Wallace Sea crowdfunding campaign, Geologists Association paid for the hosting, uh, the team with uh, Claire, Laura and Lars, and then Silverchip, whose web design technology we're using to build uh, this whole online museum with uh, Liam and Jane there in the middle. They've been great. So, all of these sources of information already exist. Uh, we've got all of these different museums and different things like journals, like the Morpho Museum and YouTube and everywhere you can find paleontological information, but it's spread out all over everywhere. And they can interact directly with the audience, but it's not as great as it can be. It's hard to find everything that you need to in one place. And this is something that the Virtual Natural History Museum is going to do. It's going to add in a step between uh, all of this. And it's a completely unnecessary step in a way. It doesn't add anything in, but it just collates and uh, delivers to, hopefully, a larger audience. 
So this is uh, the concept art for the museum. It is literally a virtual museum. It's created to represent a museum in every single way. From the very entrance, uh, you have to walk into it. There's no reason why you have to do that. You could just appear in the museum, but it's engaging, it's fun. It's like coming into the museum. It adds the computer game element to it. And then you've got the hallway where, where you've got like the big... We're going to get the Diplodocus from the Natural History Museum. It's going to end up in our museum now that they've gotten rid of it. And we've got shops, we've got an art gallery where we can put all details about like how to create uh, really nice paleo art and stuff like that. We've got a theatre where we could put on lectures, we could put on films. Uh, lift uh, every floor of the museum is going to be a different period of time. Yeah, we, we could have a Mesozoic Mammals exhibit. We could have... The, the beauty of it is it's so flexible. We could have a whole wing dedicated to Mesozoic Mammals. It's not even listening. <laughs> and then we can also offer things that you can't get in real museums, such as access to the collection stores or the prep labs. We could have a, an imaging suite. We could have a synchrotron in there that engages the public with things that they wouldn't normally have access to. So this is a mock-up of how it's going to look. And this is the Jurassic floor. Uh, basically, you'll come out of the lift at the top and go and have a look in any of the cabinets. And a little pop-up will appear, and then you'll get the information. And this is just the little walkthrough. I hope that it's muted. Yeah, so your little guy here, Darwin in this instance, has walked over to the Ammonites case, selected which one he wants, pulled up the images, gets all the information, all of the metadata and the references, and then he can have a look at the 3D picture, and then off he goes, has a little walk over to this exhibit, and will go and have a look at the ichthyosaurs, and likewise has a look at whichever one he wants. Um, so, we've arranged a little demo, so if everyone has their laptops or phones or internet connected devices, if you go onto this URL right now, you can have a little run around the museum, uh, which will be fun for everyone and not so much fun for anyone watching on the video. Yeah, just uh, click register at the bottom, and then you can all have fun doing that. I'll pull up, I'll put up the URL in a bit anyway. So, whilst uh, everyone's doing that, and for the older people who don't have phones and computers and stuff, I'll go on a bit about how we add content. <laughs> so, uh, we initially intended that it would be automatic integration of all of these uh, collections of the museums. Uh, but it costs too much uh, to devise some software program that would go and uh, just collect information. So we're going to have to do it all manually. And with an image that we upload, we're going to include all metadata, so a full taxonomic breakdown, chronostratigraphy, how old it is, uh, the locality, we're going to state usage rights, whether or not you're free to reuse the photo, uh, and write a little bit about why it's important. It's a lot of information, but it gives us a hell of a lot of flexibility in how we can use it. So, we've got all that metadata, and then we can create a, a, a collection of any group of uh, pictures or videos or whatever by these metadata tags. So we can create, uh, in the Silurian room, we can put together something with all of the Eurypterids. We could put together something that uh, shows all the Cretaceous... Um, velociraptors from Mongolia or whatever you want. And we can also um, put in uh, collections that um, are relevant to certain parts of the curriculum as well. So we could have a cabinet that perhaps shows all the information that you need to see to teach yourself about brachiopods in the UK's curriculum at A level. Uh, and then we assign uh, this little collection a coordinate in our museum world, be it in a cabinet or an information panel, and then when you walk up to it, then all of the information pops up. So what are the benefits of having a virtual museum? Well, there are absolutely no size limits. The museum can be uh, virtually infinite. 
uh, we can make a room of any size and put in as basically as many specimens as has have been digitised. So uh, everything can go on display. There's no uh, physical constraints. There are no opening times and no actual location, which means that uh, as soon as it goes online, it is uh, it could be the world's biggest paleontological museum in everyone's front room. All you need is a computer to access it, and you're good to go. It's incredibly easily editable, so we can keep up to date with all the latest research. In the little example that I've got people running around on, you can actually go and have a look at uh, Cetacosaurus and see all of the 3D uh, uh, camouflage patterns that was just released uh, yesterday. So it's really easy to uh, change and uh, to keep things fresh. We can add in special exhibitions and stuff like that uh, whenever we conceive them. There's no things like having to worry about printing off all of the uh, physical information like you have to do in a real museum. And there's complete flexibility in what we can show. We can have images, 3D models, PDFs, videos. Uh, we've even got a computer game that we're going to put in the computer game, so, which is very meta. Uh, and we can put in uh, elements that really keep me interested in gaming inside of the museum, so things to unlock um, and different achievements that you can go and get. Say, like, you, you've managed to see all of the dinosaurs in the museum. Here's a little star. Well done. And uh, at the minute, it's a pretty huge construction task. Uh, getting everything able to work is, has taken a long time. But we're just about finished all of the back end stuff. And the front end, all the artwork's completed, but we still got to like design all the rooms and where everything's going to be laid out. And then all of the data entries must be man uh, manual. And for this reason, we're going to try and crowdsource this. And so really, I'm looking for everyone's help in putting data into the museum. So if, for instance, you're working on mesozoic mammals, you've got your favorite one that you want everyone to know about, just upload the picture with the information, and then we can put a special exhibition. You can curate your own exhibition effectively in just a few uh, minutes. So uh, we'll be releasing a submissions page soon where you can uh, upload information, and then that will help get the museum up and running in the first instance. Uh, and then finances, the crowdfunding campaign is still open, so the more money we put into it, the more features we can add in. There's basically, it's, the, the scope of what we can do with this museum is absolutely huge. We can put anything in, and the more money we get, the more likely we can add in extra features. And we're looking to launch in early 2017. So that's the URL again, if anyone wants to join in. And I'll take any questions in the meantime.